The Lewis Chessmen um, date from between about 1150 and 1200 AD, from the Middle Ages. This was a time of, of important evolution in the game of, of chess. The Lewis Chessmen are also, as you may have seen, or I hope you've seen the exhibition, they're fantastic uh, architectural specimens. They're, they're great works of art. And um, chess players, we spend most of our time when we're playing chess playing with fairly dull sets. <laughs> I've got an example of the, uh, in my speech, my speech here today. But um, at other times, you know, we get a ch chance to step back and appreciate them. And the wide range of things that people have done to create chess sets, the, the types of uh, experimentation, the materials, the wide range of imagination you'll see with some of the chess sets that I've pulled together for this exhibition, um, for my talk, excuse me. We'll start with the history of chess and the evolution of it. Uh, the game dates it back about 1,500 years. Um, it, it is thought to have uh, originated in India. Um, it was a game called, at the time, Shataranja. It means literally uh, four divisions, uh, four military divisions. It was based upon, as it says here in this slide, the infantry, who are today's pawns, cavalry, who are today's knights, elephants, we'll get to that in a second, and chariots, which are today's rooks. So in many ways, the game that was started 1,500 years ago, and we don't really know exactly why or how, um, is very similar to the game that's played today with a couple of important differences. Um, the game spread initially uh, to Persia. This is a book from, uh, this is an illustration from the Book of Kings. which was written about 1,000 AD in uh, Persia. And what it depicts is actually how the game arrived in Persia or at least it's a story about how it arrived in Persia. Supposedly, a Raja in India uh, sent a copy of the game to uh, the Persian um, royal, member of the royal, royal family and said, uh, to a Persian Shah, excuse me, and said, you know, without explaining the rules, here, is these, here are these pieces. Can you or your advisors figure out what this game is and what the rules are and how it's played? And uh, this being a Persian text, of course, they did that. <laughs> Uh, within a day or so, they came back and they explained the rules, and this is actually an illustration of one of the advisors to the Persian Shah's king explaining to the Indian envoy how the game works and being told, yes, you're right. The Persians then turned it around and uh, sent off a game to uh, the Indian Raja and said, can you explain how this game works? And it was basically the game of backgammon, um, and they failed. And as a result, the Indian Raja supposedly, according to the story, had to ship all kinds of jewels and gold to the Persian Shah. <laughs> Um, this is a map which explains more or less uh, chronologically and also geographically how the game spread. Uh, the number one is roughly where, uh, in India where, where the game was thought to have originated. Uh, by the 7th century, within 100, it spread rather rapidly to Persia and then from Persia uh, through North Africa. The Arabs uh, conquered the Persians and they uh, cultivated the game and loved the game and they took it with them whenever, wherever they went and wherever they conquered. Uh, eventually, of course, they went into southern Europe through Spain, which became one of the centers for chess, for chess in Europe, and of course, also through Italy. And then from there, the game spread north into northern Europe. So it took several hundred years, but uh, it got there. Um, when it's in its original form, um, the game had 32 pieces, and the important, this is a Persian set from the 12th century, um, and what's important to, to note here are that there are a couple of pieces which are a little bit different, although you can't really tell because the, the design is very abstract. I think, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, oh, there it is. This thing is the, is the elephant. Uh, it's not, it's sitting in a position, if, for those who are familiar with chess today, which is now occupied by the bishop. And this is the shah or king, and this piece, which looks very similar to the shah or king, is the vizier, the advisor to the, to the shah or the king. They didn't have a queen at that point. This type of chess set or, um, persisted for hundreds of years after the introduction of the game. It persisted even in Europe at times when chess itself was changing. So there were, there were times when both types of chess with, or both types of pieces coexisted together. Uh, this is a piece from, um, I think it's the Metropolitan's uh, collection. This, of course, is a bishop. Uh, what happened at some point, early in, after the came, went into Europe, uh, around 700, 800 AD, shortly after that, within 100 or 200 years, uh, 
bishops began to appear in place of elephants. Uh, the reason might have been that if you look at the elephants, they have these two protuberances, which sort of indicate the tusks, and it is possible that people looked at these and, and they probably didn't know in Europe what elephants were. They certainly weren't a familiar element of their, uh, their everyday life, and they might have said, you know what, that looks a little bit like a bishop's mitre. And so that's one theory as to why they started to think about these things as bishops as opposed to elephants. Of course, another part, another theory has to do with the fact that the church was start establishing its power within Europe at this time. This is a time of incredible growth for the, from the, for the church in terms of its, uh, its prestige, its power. It was uh, trying to um, show that, you know, it show it provide its place in the hierarchy. And clearly, if you're setting up a hierarch hierarchical situation, you have the nexus of power, the, the very center of power, you have the king and the queen, the royalty, or whatever the royalty was. It wasn't a queen, necessarily but you have the king, and you want to be proximate to that, as close to that as possible. And the, bish the bishops, by replacing the elephants, end up being literally right next to the, the uh, king and the queen, or the other, or the vizier on the chessboard. This, by the way, this piece is from, uh, as it says, from Sicily. Again, this is an area that was under uh, the Moorish control um, in the early part of well, the Middle Ages. And they were still, this piece, it's thought to be actually an, an elephant, um, but it could, have, could be a bishop, it's not quite clear, of course, from the design. Uh, the other piece that changed markedly was the vizier became the queen. Um, there was, there was, there's a woman who, uh, named uh, Marilyn Yalom who wrote a book called Birth of the Chess Queen, which is a pretty good book in terms of its research. A lot of this material I'm going to talk to you about is from that book. There were a lot of uh, very powerful queens who emerged in the early Middle Ages, um, particularly uh, the two here who were... Um, at the head of the Holy Roman Empire at various points, partly because of the deaths of their husbands. And as the game, again, evolved, and as they took hold in Europe, other queens came to power, um, in both in Spain um, and also in France, um, these also in uh, Scandinavia. And uh, again, this is the time when actually the game took on, Isabella was queen, it was the time when the game became, it's actually in, came into its modern form in a book that was written in Spain at the time. Uh, finally, Catherine the Great is an interesting story as well because in Russia, there was the last country really to adopt the chess queen, at least in Europe. It did it around the time that Catherine the Great became the, the uh, Russian empress. So it's, it, it seems to play into the idea that at least it, it is plausible that the, the rise of the queens, whether it, it just convinced other people that you know, the queen should be on the board or maybe they actually had an influence on the people who were designing the sets. Of course, again, it also made sense you know, if you're in, living in Europe, you don't know what a vizier is, but you do know what a queen is. There's, a, there's quite a few of those around at the time. Um, the first appearance of the queen in literature takes place in around 1,080, late, late 1990s. And again, if we go back a couple of slides, you see that these, these two, queen, two queens, these empresses, this is when they lived. So there was a monk who wrote a, a, an epic poem or large, uh, about chess and in its poem, instead of a vizier, there's a queen. It seems to coincide very nicely with the time when they were, had taken, were heading the uh, Holy Roman Empire. One of the in other interesting things, at least to me, is the development of the, the way the chess pieces are referred to. These are, in each case, these are the words, fierce and fierce, and fierce, and fierce are the words for uh, the queen in Persian or in Arabic. Feel is the word for bishop, or I'm sorry, for elephant, excuse me. Uh, and this, I'm sorry, this is the, this is the word for, for vizier, not queen. But as the game again developed, uh, it, it, you can see that some, there's an influence here. The, the game in, in Spanish, in Spanish, the piece in, uh, for bishop is alfil, which comes directly from feel from the Persian. So this is a direct, and, and same thing in Italy. Again, keep in mind that both of these places were countries which were under Moorish control. Uh, in France, the, the, um, they referred initially to the piece which they started to call the queen as the fierce, which seems to come directly from first. And again, the same thing is true in Russian. So even these are, these are the words, these were the words that were used up until late Middle Ages. They then became known as dames. They, they, they changed from this initial uh, uh, use of this word, which clearly echoes what it was in Persian, to something different. And a part of it had to do with the elevation of the queen as a piece. Initially, the idea, was, the, the concern or the thought was that the pieces were, the queen was a sort of, a, well, first it was a weak piece, 
but also that um, the, the, the attitude towards women at the time was still undergoing some changes. As the queens took more control and more power, and as the, the, they also gained more respect on the chessboard, and, and we'll get also to what happened to them as pieces in terms of their powers, uh, they changed the names, the way they referred to them, and now they became more elevated. Uh, this is a, uh, in, there was a very famous book written by this monk, Jac Jacobus of uh, de Sesulis, Sesu uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but anyway, it was about, about it was a collection of his sermons. He was a, a Dominican monk, he lived from about the, in 1260, 1270 to, to about 1320, and he wrote these sermons uh, on, uh, where he used chess as basically a, a model for how people should live in society. This book, strangely enough, became, after the Bible, the most popular book in all of Europe. It was reprinted in many, many different languages, and when printing presses were invented some um, you know, a couple hundred years later, it was one of the first books that was widely printed and distributed around Europe. So chess had become so central to the, to the way people lived in Europe that he actually referred to it and used it as a model. And one of the things that's interesting to me, again, this is just maybe from a chess standpoint, standpoint is he, he actually distinguished, or tried to distinguish uh, the roles of the pawns and looking again at the hierarchy in, in chess. There was roles and responsibilities, I'm sorry, the hierarchy in society, the roles and responsibilities that people had, uh, he, he, he equated them to what they did in, on the chessboard. So for each of the pawns, he came up with a descriptive for you know what, what type of uh, you know, I guess person at the bottom of the of the social structure they they represented, and this set, which is from uh, early 18th century, I, we're going to get to the sets pretty soon. This is one of the reasons again I love chess. Uh, in, in the fact that I don't, aside from the fact that I love just to play it, uh, this chess set actually builds on his ideas. It's actually uses as the basis for the figures that it was that that were made from the set. This is a again Southern Germany, early 18th century. The thing which I really love, again, about looking at this set, is that each one of these, these pawns represents Sicilius's ideas. So this, this set was made a couple hundred years after the book was even more widely distributed than it already had been. These are, the, of course, the white figures. And I mean, I love particularly this guy. I'm not sure exactly what he does, but it's, uh, but they're, they're meant to represent each of the, each of the sort of the basic, you know, roles and, and functions in society. The same thing with the black pieces as well. Um, as the queen worked its way throughout Europe, and it didn't happen all at once. I mean, there were some places that still used viziers, some places that used queens, but of course it became more prominent. And as the, the bishop also became more prominent, uh, there, were s there were several things that happened in terms of the, the, the way the, rule the game was played, the role of the game itself. Um, one of the things I noted here, I'm not gonna go into at great length, was that the game had started, some people had played the game using dice. It had been a gambling game, and they had also used dice to actually determine which piece they should move. Uh, the pawns had also been somewhat more limited. As the game evolved in the Middle Ages, as it changed, as it was widely more, 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 more widely played and disseminated, they actually changed the, some of the rules. And this wasn't uniformly done. But the most important developments clearly were in the actual movement of the pieces. The, I've used queens here because I don't have a, a vizier. I'm not even sure what a vizier would look like. But, um, the original vizier was a very limited piece. It was a defensive piece. You could only move one square in either direction diagonally. And if you got a pawn down to the end of the board, it did promote, just like it does in today's game, I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with the rules, but then it would just become a vizier and it would just, it would just move one square again diagonally back. So it didn't have much of a, uh, didn't, couldn't do much. In the final form, in today's, today's chess, uh, and this is pretty much from the end of the 15th century, the queen is the most powerful piece on the board, which is a, an astonishing uh, you know, development. I mean, it's, it's, the queen can move now horizontally, vertically, and, and, and diagonally, and it, and it actually is the fiercest fierce piece on the board, which is maybe goes back to, the, again, the use of the word fierce, that they, uh, maybe this was an inspiration for how they would want to change the, the role of the queen. The elephants, again, I'm sorry, I had to use bishops, but um, the elephants were also a very defensive piece. They could only hop basically th one, from one square to th the third square in this direction or this direction. So if you look at it, you can actually count the elephants had a very limited number of squares they could even go to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I think there's an eighth uh, down here, right? So they, they, had, they were again a defensive piece. They didn't have much of a role. As the church, um, again, became more powerful in Europe, 
they began to take on a, this different role, which was uh, the one they have today, where they could r still go diagonally, but as many squares as they wanted to. And they became a much, again, a much more important piece in terms of the game. The game also speeded up and became a more engaging game for people who wanted to play it. Um, the, the modern chess, in terms of the rules, really traces itself to the end of the 15th century. This was a book published, um, this, this is, most chess players, people who have played chess for many, many years are familiar with this name because there's actually a, a position in chess named after him. It's called the Lucina position. It refers to uh, how to s solve a particular endgame problem. He, he, he published this book in the end of the 15th, at the end of the 15th century, and the rules in this book, which include uh, the ones about uh, having the pawns be allowed to move two spaces as opposed to uh, just one, because they'd only been allowed to move one, this is pretty much the rules that we follow today. So somewhere along the lines, in those, in the, between the time that chess made it itself into, into, into Europe at the end of, let's say in the 700s or 800s, and the end of the 15th century, it changed to what we, the game that we now play today. And there hasn't been, there have been a couple of minor developments since, since then, one of them being uh, the rule of castling, but, and another one being a rule called en passant, but they're not as important as as the, the, the change in the, in the role and the function of the vizier slash bishop, I'm sorry, queen, and the uh, elephant slash bishop. Now I'm going to move on to the part of the, the lecture about chess sets as artwork. Um, I'm a chess player, as Barbara said, and I've played chess for many, many years, and uh, one of the great things about chess pieces is that they have weight and they have a feel, and it's, it's a tactile thing. I mean, you can see um, sometimes elite players, that when they when they capture a piece, they'll sit there and they'll spin it in their fingers and they're, you know, they're kind of juggling it. There's actually a guy who's going to play for the World Championship in two months and he takes the pieces and he clasps them in his hands underneath the table and he's constantly rolling them. We love, there's something that we love about handling chess pieces. And all the chess pieces that you're about to see in, in this collection, none of them are good for playing with, but they're great for probably handling and for looking at. Um, this is the standard chess set that we all use. This is, um, this was, this. It's called the Staunton Design. It was named after a guy named Howard Staunton, who was the best chess player in the world. It was adopted um, as it was he, he gave it his imprimatur in 1851 to coincide with the first major international tournament. In 1924, the World Chess Federation adopted it as the st standard for all international matches and events. So everybody who plays chess plays with something that isn't something like this. Not quite this nice set. This is a, an ivory set, actually from the vintage of Howard Staunton's era, but they look very similar to this. Um, they're very effective, simple to recognize. This, of course, is the king, this is the queen, bishop, knight, rook, and pawn. They're easily identifiable, which is good when you're looking at a board and trying to puzzle out what your opponent's doing and what you want to do. Um, despite the fact that the uh, Islam, uh, sorry, the things change, the, the Islamic influence on chess sets, because they, uh, the first chess that I showed you, showed you was from um, Persia, was abstract. They've, that's con there's con a continuing influence from abstract design and from Islamic art. For reasons I'm not sure we completely agree on, the, uh, many of the chess sets that, uh, in, that were used in Islam were, not, were abstract, they were not figurative. There's, some people have said it's because they were not allowed to, you know, there, was, there are prohibitions against using figures, figures in, uh, in, in the Quran, but in some places in, uh, in Islam, in Islamic areas, they did have paintings and sculptures that were figurative. So this wouldn't necessarily have prevented them from using some other type of set, but they seem to dislike these. I find this very difficult to look at. And again, I, I mean, you can sort of, like, you can clearly see what's a king and a queen, but if you look at the thing, all the shapes are very similar. This is another one, again, sort of similar to uh, another um, set. This one is from, uh, this is, I'm um, sorry, this is in India from the 17th century, and it's, you know, it, it's, I think if I was playing, using this as a chess set, I would, I would probably admire it from the standpoint of it's a beautiful set, but I wouldn't find it very practical. Many of the chess sets uh, revolve around, uh, to me, themes. I mean, of course, uh, chess is a game which is, in which two sides oppose each other, so it would lend itself to depictions of wars. And um, a lot of the sets that I looked at, and most of these sets, by the way, come from a, a fantastic book of a collection. Um, a, a Detroit doctor named George Dean who amassed this, this fantastic collection of chess sets over about 40 years. Most of these are drawn from his book called Chess Masterpieces, which uh, is a beautiful, beautiful book. I highly recommend it. This chess set is from 18th century France. It depicts the Punic Wars. Um, and it's made of ivory. Uh, 
one of the interesting things to me is that, uh, at least on one side, instead of bishops, they have boats. Um, they, they, one of the things that you start to get into as you get into these decorative and artistic sets is that they start to experiment with the form. You know, you don't have to stick to, well, there's a queen here or there's a bishop, you know, here or whatever. You can actually have some fun with it. And uh, I, I th also, what I also noticed is in some of these sets is that even though the elephant had sort of been drummed out of the game, it sometimes pops up again. Uh, this one happens to be on, under a rook, but in some cases they're even in the place of elephants. I'm sorry, in the place of bishops. So some places actually still go back to, to the older form. This set is, uh, the, depicts the Battle of Tobiak, which is about 500 AD. So it's also interesting the historical references that some of the set designers come up with. Uh, this is uh, also 18th century France. And I, I'm just, again, i struck by the fact, that I guess, of the, the topic that they used. Um, this is a set depicting the, Crus the Third Crusade, which is from Denmark, uh, and is porcelain uh, from about 1914. Uh, this, and then one of the very typical, a lot of the sets that I see or have seen um, get into the wars around Napoleon, uh, around the time of Napoleon, whether they're either French or because they're depicting his defeat. This, this set is from uh, early 19th century France, and uh, the the king is Napoleon, the queen is Josephine, and over here we have King George and Queen Charlotte. So uh, you'll see this happen again. This is a better look at this, some of these figures. What I also find I love about these figures is that they're so detailed. A, you can actually tell who these people are. It's not really hard to, uh, to figure out. This is another uh, one of these sets from the same, depicting, again, sort of same era. This is the War of 1812. Um, it's, uh, this is a ceramic set. It's um, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, this, I'm, this is not that. This is something else. This is an earlier set. Uh, I've gotten my information confused, but it's, I know it's uh, King George, I think it was. And, uh, well, we'll go keep going. This is another one, Napoleonic set, obviously. And this, what's interesting here, again, is there's this, because it's a f decorative set and it's not necessarily function, meant to be functional, the queen is uh, clearly not <laughs> a queen. <laughs> It's one of his top generals. I think it's actually, it's, uh, it's uh, Jacques Mouret, and then on the other side, um, we have, this is actually a set uh, uh, having to do with um, his, his conflict with, with Russia. This is uh, Tsar Alexander I, and his queen is General, General Kutzo, Kutzo Tuzov. So, um, and this is in the sort of the same form. This is obviously a revolutionary, I'm sorry, a Civil War set. We have, again, Abraham Lincoln, and his queen is Ulysses S. Grant, and uh, Jefferson Davis and uh, Robert E. Lee is his queen. Uh, World War I, um, and uh, what I love, again, is, is, there's, these are, there's a lot of range of things you can do with these chess, types of chess sets. Um, I think one of these is, I forget, I think one of them was Mussolini, but I'm not quite sure. No, it's not Mussolini, I'm sorry, it's the, this is the uh, World War I. There's a different set which we'll get to, which has got Mussolini in it. But the, what, I, what it's amazing to me about this is, again, how expressive they can be with the, what they're doing. They don't have to stick to figures as well. Um, this set is, uh, has to do with the Italian War, and I th it's, it is uh, friends, this is, there's the, this is Franz Joseph, I believe, and Empress Elizabeth, and this is uh, Napoleon III and Empress Eugenia. Uh, this is the set I was mentioning earlier. This is Mussolini. This is the, uh, the Ethiopian War and, uh, from the early 20th century. This, this set's from the 1930s, and it's, I think, out of porcelain. I'm sorry, it's ivory, excuse me. Oh, this, I'm sorry, this is great. <laughs> this, this, uh, this actually, uh, I think Dr. Dean actually had made, but this is, uh, I said obviously about World War II. Uh, we have here uh, Hitler and Eva Braun, Emperor Hirohito. This is Mussolini, FDR. Um, this is uh, Stalin, of course, this is Churchill. They're obviously very stylized, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I'm not sure, again, I could use this set in the game, but it certainly would be fun to try. <laughs> um, they're also, again, because of this sort of the, the, uh, the way that chess lends itself to sort of a, a, a dialogue or a conflict between two things, it's often used for social and political commentary. This is a set from uh, 1923, I believe, or so it's an early, early part of the 20th century. It depicts um, elements of the, I'm sorry, mid-20th century, I guess. It depicts elements of the Cold War. 
Here we have uh, capitalism on one side. We have death holding a femur. We have uh, enchained workers. Um, and then, of course, the good guys are the communists. And we have a, a worker and uh, a, a, a obviously looking very regal and uh, a good person. The, the worker is now not in chains. So um, this is another, on the same theme, this is a propaganda set. Uh, we have, again, we have uh, communist workers or, or socialist workers uh, against the capitalist pigs. Or, you know, the, uh, the exemplified by the, the king is here is a capitalist with, uh, I think, a, and the uh, queen has a fur and the workers on the, uh, on the communist side are obviously, they're, they're dressed sort of shabbily, but they're, uh, they're, they're noble people. They're, they have a different type of bearing to them. They're also, of course, larger figures to suggest, I guess, that they're better people. Uh, another wonderful set. Um, this one is terracotta, actually. And that's another thing, this, this, the materials that are used, the range is astonishing. This is a, a Vietnam War set, Vietnam era war set. Uh, we have on this side the doves, Martin Luther King, Joan Baez. Uh, this is a RFK. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I, know, if I remember everybody else. And on the Hawks side, we have uh, LBJ. Um, there's Ronald Reagan, gov of course, governor at the time of California, uh, Richard Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, Dean Rusk. Um, you can have a lot of fun with this sort of stuff. Another. another one that lends itself to natural use is good versus evil. This is the evil side. I happen to like them better. <laughs> but you can see the, how, how they contrast with the, uh, with the good side. This is actually Florence, 18th century, and uh, ivory, ivory and ebony. Another fun one. This is virtue versus uh, vice, 19th century. Um, again, I, I like the fact that they put, uh, this is vice in the, in the front, in case you couldn't tell. The king has a... Uh, uh, is, uh, is, is holding a cup of drink, and he's got a, r a ruddy nose, and so does the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and this is another great one. Um, in, in terms of the idea of contrasts, uh, this is uh, 1835. Well, it's, uh, it's about 200 years old. It's porcelain, Berlin, Germany, and it's, take your choice, blondes or brunettes. <laughs> Uh, obviously, again, they're, they're, I think chess sets are great works of art. Um, this, this is a fascinating story behind this. This is Fabergé. Uh, Dr. Dean acquired this set um, uh, some years ago. It, I'm not going to go into the whole history of it, but it's, it's, he knew this had existed, and, uh, and, it, and by chance he happened to come upon it at a time when somebody had just displayed it, and he basically haggled them into agreeing to let him uh, buy the set. It's uh, silver, and it's... Uh, I'm trying to remember the other materials, but it's a, um, it's, uh, there's, a, there's enamel, there's a, it's, it's handmade, it's a beautiful thing. You can see the inscription down here from 1904, 1905. What he didn't know when he acquired the first set, and that's part of the reason why he, how he happened to acquire the set, was there was a second set that Fabergé had made some 10 years later. And this, again, echoing this theme, theme of war, these are the, uh, this is uh, Egyptians versus the Assyrians. So this was, an, it's a very different style than the uh, first one, but, but Fabergé nonetheless. This is a set commissioned by Catherine the Great, entirely of amber. Um, and she, what she did was she had herself cast as the queen. Her king is not the king, but her lover, Potemkin. Uh, this is her son, and this is his wife, so as the, as the opposing king and queen. Of course, she has to be the biggest figure. This is a porcelain set. Again, we start to see um, there's a wide range of materials. This is a 17th century porcelain set. I forget from which country offhand, but but these these sets are I, to, to me again, uh, even though they're not very practical, I think of them as extraordinary. This is jasperware, uh, which is I think King George the Third. This is uh, from Venice or from Murano actually. I guess it's Murano glassware. Um, this is another type of, this is a crystal set, it's actually contemporary, but it's, uh, uh, it just, again, shows a wide range. I love this set. This is a Chinese set, um, in, I think the 19th or 18th, 18th century, I mean, it's 18th century, I believe, and uh, it's ivory, of course. Um, it's extraordinary detail uh, on this set. Uh, when, I, we, when I look into the, zoom in, you can see how the figures are carved. There's an, an amazing amount of workmanship in this. Even the shields themselves are expressive. 
and in the base of the figures you see these inc incredibly elaborate scenes. Um, it just, it gives, at least for me, it gives me a whole, whole different appreciation for, for what you can do with these things. The, even the boards can be decorative and uh, quite elaborate. This is the obverse of that board, which is from the 17th century. Uh, another board I just thought was absolutely beautiful. I mean, the chess set itself is pretty nice, but the, the board is extraordinary. Um, and of course, the materials. Again, as I mentioned this, this is a rock crystal uh, with silver gilt. Uh, and this is from the 17th century. This is tortoise shell used as, as for the material for the pieces. Uh, coral. This is uranium glass. Amber again. And of course, you can carve rather wonderful details into this. Uh, this is a set which depicts Africans versus, and I think it's, uh, I know it's Europeans, but that's right, Europeans and, and Africans. It's made of a combination of coral, marble, I, uh, and ebony. This is a set from uh, uh, Java. It's made of bamboo. And again, it's expressed, it's amazing the figures, the expression, expressions of the figures. There's the elephant appearing again, because it's an Easter. This is a, uh, from Morocco, mid 19th century. It's entirely out of silk. It's a traveling set. And then, of course, if you can go over the top if you want to, <laughs> sorry, yeah, that's. <laughs> Then you have the other end of the spectrum, or not the other end of the spectrum, but I mean, these are rather elaborate, ornate uh, sets. These are, of course, precious jewels, silver, gilded uh, silver. This is a Rococo set from the mid-17th mid century, I believe, semi-precious stones, uh, silver and enamel with, with precious stones uh, from, I think, the mid-18, no, this is the uh, early 20th century. Um, beautiful enamel, and this is a Baroque set and uh, the attention to detail, and again, the, 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 all the stones they've used to decorate these figures. Even the coats of arms are all different and very elaborate. Uh, one of the other things that's important about some of these sets, and this is, I, this is a piece, again, from the Metropolitan's uh, own collection, is that they sometimes uh, told you something about the way people actually dressed in the particular era. This is a chess set, chess piece, or obviously a knight, but uh, I'm, I'm told, I understand that this is one of the only examples of of actually, it actually shows what horse armor was like back in the Middle Ages, the complete set of horse armor. Uh, this is a set that, uh, which I liked again, just because it's, uh, the costuming is, is fantastic. What I particularly like were the jesters, which seem to be actually, and this is a 17th century set. It's, of course, it's not contemporary, but they, they uh, obviously have taken some time to recreate the period costumes. Same thing with this. This is in the Battle of Jarnak. So it's a set commemorating that. Um, this is a set which, uh, looking at the British and Chinese wars in the, and this is actually from the 19th century, or conflicts. I'm sorry, this is not the, that's not that set, this is a different set, this is a Buechler set, which is, that's the one from the Chinese and British conflict. I'm going to go through a, a bit of these now. There's a, a, all kinds of, of uh, subjects matters. I mean, it's pretty much, you can stretch your imagination in any way you want. Insects, sea creatures and even tulips. Um, Duchamp was a, a very passionate chess player. In fact, he basically gave up chess. I'm sorry, gave up being an artist to be a chess player. Uh, now, these, these quotes of his sort of, I think, sum up to some degree why he did this. Uh, particularly, I've, I've sort of memorized this one. So when everybody, somebody says, well, what are you doing playing chess all the time? Well, <laughs> to me, this is the answer. Um, in the mid-1940s, he, uh, along with Julian Levy, organized a landmark exhibition at Julian Levy's gallery. And uh, they invited some of the top artists of the day to design chess sets, some of whom were already passionate players. This is a picture from the exhibition. This is Duchamp with his back to the camera making moves against uh, several people who were actually playing this man, who was a famous grandmaster named George Koltanowski. He was playing them blindfold. He was announcing the moves out loud. Uh, this, this set here that's being used by Shawinsky is a Bauhaus set. And again, I find this, this is by Joseph Hurt, uh, Hurt, Hartwig, and I find this absolutely impossible to use, but certainly interesting in terms of the reimagining of the shapes of the chess pieces. This was Max Ernst's contribution to the, to the uh, exhibition. And what's interesting to me, again, is they didn't, this is not just a one-off for him. He used it in a sculpture he did 10 years later. You can see some of the pieces, and of course, even the subject again. So the artists incorporated this into their work, at least some of them. This is Man Ray's contribution to the exhibition. 
And uh, this is Isamu Noguchi. By the way, a lot of these images we're looking at are from Noguchi's uh, museum because they actually did a retrospective of the exhi exhibition back in 2005 on the, uh, I guess, 60th anniversary. These were pieces designed by Noguchi along with the table to go with the set. And Andre Breton <laughs> had to put his two cents in, I guess. <laughs> I like this one personally. <laughs> this was not part of the exhibition, but I love it. Salvador Del Dali, he just made his own fingers. And this is a remarkable. Uh, as part of the, the exhibition, uh, they invited a couple of composers to also uh, contribute, and John Cage composed an entire musical score in the form of a chessboard. I haven't. Finally, um, I'm going to uh, about wrap things up, but chess sets continue. I mean, these, everything I've been showing is historical, except for this chess set, which actually is uh, Yoruda. It comes from, it's from Nigeria. A friend of mine uh, was in Nigeria a couple months ago and bought this on the street. And uh, it's just, again, it to me is phenomenal that there's so much energy and effort uh, going into this. It's the materials are uh, it's light thorn wood, um, which I guess is easy for carving and probably cheap material. But um, there, I wish I had some more contemporary stuff. There was, there's some chess sets I saw that are, uh, again, extraordinary in terms of the, the creativity that some of these people use whether they're artists or otherwise, uh, to display and talk about the chess sets. I, I saw actually a chess set that had, was entirely of women versus a chess set that was entirely of men. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, it, it's not, it, I, I think people probably think that chess sets, because you, know, you have to have 32 pieces, you have to have a board, it constrains you, but clearly there's a lot of different ways that uh, people can go, a lot of different directions. I think my time is about up, so I'm gonna stop. Anyway, thank you.